This is Join Us in France, episode 437, 437. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France. Everyday life in France, great places to visit in France, French culture, history, gastronomy, and news related to travel to France. Today, I bring you a conversation with Elise Riven of Toulouse Guided Walks about Baron Haussmann, the man who transformed Paris. Understanding Haussmann's impact on Paris is wonderful for you, visitors, because it offers insight into the city's unique character, history, and development. Today, we'll talk about Paris's urban design, architectural evolution, and you, visitors, will gain a richer and more meaningful travel experience. And we'll keep it real because it wasn't all butterflies and rainbows. <laughs> This podcast is supported by donors and listeners who buy my tours and services, including my itinerary consult service and my GPS self-guided tours of Paris on the Voice Map app. And you can browse all of that at my boutique, joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique. In the next few days, I'm going to send out a newsletter about why it's important for you to bring your kids to Paris so they can see some of the world's best museums. You can make it the world's best field trip and make it a vacation they'll remember. To sign up for the newsletter, go to joinusinfrance.com for slash newsletter. And for the magazine part of the podcast, after the interview, I'll discuss passports and why you need to look at yours and see when it expires. I'll also talk about booking restaurants in Paris. Do you really have to do that? Bonjour, Elise. Bonjour, Annie. We have a great episode today, lots of history. You are going to tell us about Haussmann and the transformation of Paris, because, of course, the man... I mean, literally, he transformed the place. He, he certainly did. I think most people who have visited Paris have walked the streets that he created. Maybe they know who he was, maybe they don't. But we have to acknowledge that the Paris that everybody knows today is Haussmann's Paris. Right. And we're going to talk about what it was like before and what the city had to go through in order to get beautified in the way it is today. Yes, indeed. So it's mostly going to be you talking today, Elise. I mean, I, I know a fair bit about this, but I'm going to let you carry the... She's going to let me carry. Okay, then I'll start off by asking you, Annie, as someone who spends time in Paris a lot, if I say to you, how many in Paris, what comes to mind? Opera. The neighborhood around the opera house. Oh, okay. Okay. Specifically the streets or the... Yes, you know, that whole uh, where the opera is and the view and all of these boulevards that intersect there, to me, it's where you see it most. But of course, there are examples of Haussmann's work all over Paris. Well, almost all over Paris. Exactly. Almost all over Paris. But you're absolutely right that there are lots of people who think of the Opera Garnier, the old opera, obviously, and the many streets that come out from there as being the epitome of Haussmann's Paris. Right. And it was really designated as such almost when Garnier, who was the architect of the opera, basically his style is his style, which is a kind of over the top kind of thing anyway. But he said that it was in honor of what Haussmann was doing that he built this opera house. And so it's a kind of extension of the inspiration, you might want to say, that Haussmann created this new kind of Paris. And it really was a new Paris because up until the 1850s, Paris entirely was medieval, which is hard for us to really grasp these days. It was, if you can imagine some of the tiny streets in the Latin Quarter or in the Marais. And that was what Paris was everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Right. So uh, people who take my Ile de la Cité tour, I take you to one of these streets that is so narrow that even the light doesn't get through really, you know. And there are some streets like that left in Paris, but very few. But you have to imagine that the whole city was like that. It must have been 
really difficult to live. I don't know. Well, it was difficult. There are three things that I think are important to know really in relation to the history of Haussmann. And one is that he modernized the city. The other is that he enlarged the city. The city doubled in size, literally doubled in size under Haussmann. And that was because, and I'll back up a little bit and give the information about how this happened and why he became the person to do it. But what they did was, originally Paris was basically, if those of you who have, of course, have been there before know that it's an arrondissement and it's like a snail. It starts with number one, which is Ile de la Cité, and it kind of circles around and goes out. And so you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you have the numbers of the larger arrondissement which are the outer ones. Well, it turns out that until the 1850s, all of those that are basically the outer ring of arrondissement didn't exist as part of Paris. Right, they were different cities. They were separate cities. They were separate villages. And one of the things that happened in the midst of all of this change, these transformations, is that they annexed, literally, they annexed all of these places Montmartre, uh, La Villette, uh, Passy in the 16th arrondissement, all of these places that have still a certain quality of village as opposed to just being anonymously the same everywhere. They are indeed places that were separate villages, which is nice because they have Bercy the same. They've maintained, and there's a little part of each of those areas that has maintained this kind of villagey quality to it. So this is Paris before. For the Eiffel Tower. Oh, yes. Before, I mean, the area where the Eiffel Tower is today was mostly fields. I mean, there were things, but not that, it wasn't dense. You know, it was sparsely occupied. And so it was completely different. That means that anything going towards the West, you know, Montparnasse, all of these, I mean, there were developments right along the river. But as soon as you went away from the river, it was really sparse. There wasn't that much there. Exactly. And aside from the outer arrondissement, the area that was added is largely on the western side of the city as it stands today. The oldest part, and of course still the oldest part, is the Ile de la Cité in the Latin Quarter. They really go back 2,000 years. And then, of course, you have the Sorbonne and all of that. And interestingly enough... You could ask the question, I asked myself the question, why, if he was doing all of this work and destroying so much of the city, why, in fact, did he not destroy this particular part of it? And part of that has to do with the prestige of the university and its history, which is why the Latin Quarter was really preserved. Along part of the sixth, which is the Saint-Germain area, you have the beginning of Haussmann with the large, beautiful boulevards. But notice, you know, around Saint-Sulpice and all of these other parts that are closer to the Latin Quarter, that was preserved as well. And that is because it was very prestigious because there were certain monasteries there that were very important in the history of Paris. And oddly enough, on the Marais side, because the Marais, the, the word actually means marshland. And of course, that goes back to the Romans when they started digging up and cleaning up the land there. But interestingly, the parts that are preserved there, which are parts that I absolutely love, are because there were so many of these mansions that were there. And he at least understood, he and of course the other people, including Napoleon III, understood that those mansions were worth saving. That's actually part of the charm of Paris is that it is very uniform because of the work Haussmann has done, but there are also bits that are entirely different. It's not like totally, you know, Soviet era, like everything the same. You know, it's not like that. But there are a lot of things that they did to kind of raise the level. And like you said, there was also a lot of modernization that came with the Haussmann works, which were absolutely necessary. Right. So let's back up a little bit. His name was Georges Eugène Haussmann. His ancestors actually were German. The name could be Alsatian, but in fact, I think it was his great-grandparents who were German who had emigrated to France. And he was born in 1809. And his family were Bonapartists. His father had been an officer in Napoleon's army. They were strange in the sense that their politics were not royalist, but Bonapartist. Now, that's kind of, there's a kind of nuance involved in that, that they were very loyal to the Napoleon's family is basically what it was. 
And they were neither really for the king nor particularly for a republic at the same time. But because of their connections, father as his grandfather, who had actually participated in the revolution, they had good positions. So they were an upper middle class family. They were not aristocrats or nobles of any kind. In fact, he called himself Baron Hausman, and it's just because he wanted to have a title. He claimed that a great grandparent had a title and there were no other descendants, but in fact, it was a phony title that he gave himself. And so he's been, now everybody calls him Baron Hausman in history, but eh, he just stuck the title on. He just, there was, you go. There you go. I'll you know, have one of those. <laughs> Countess Annie, there you go, you know. Hey, why not? I think he considered himself important enough to be called Baron, you know, by the end of his life. And why not? Right, exactly. So he had a very good uh, education. He studied law and probably because of the good contacts that his family had, he very, very quickly started to go up through the administration. Now, the 19th century, of course, is very complicated. Even for me, after all my years here, the moments when it was restored king, the moments when it was Napoleon or a Bonaparte, the moments when there was a bit of a republic, it kind of goes back and forth so much that it's hard to keep track. So by the time George Hausman is a young man, we are entering a time when it goes back to a period of more or less first royalists. And then what happens is that Napoleon's nephew, Louis Napoleon III, winds up first becoming president and then becoming emperor. This is a time of, if you look at the timeline of who was in charge, it changes constantly there. But yes, they were always looking for stability and not getting it for more than 20 years or so. You know, it was complicated. Yeah, it was unfortunately a real yo-yo century for France. But what happened is, this is very fascinating. So here we have Hausmann, who is a brilliant young man and who is clearly very ambitious. And he becomes an under préfet, which is what we would say in French, but I, I translated it as assistant préfet because I don't think that under préfet doesn't make much sense in English. Yeah. No. Sous-préfet. Sous-préfet. Sous Sous-préfet. Yeah. Sous which means basically he's the... It's like being the vice president of a region, in a sense. It's like the... Of a department. Of a department. But and actually, and in fact, it was a time at that point, it was a little bit more than sometimes than a just a department. It's funny how they cut it up. But basically what happened was he served a lot in the southwest of France. He was first under préfet in the Latin Garonne, which is right next to us, in the Ariège, which is, of course, right next to us. In, and a lot of time he was in the Gironde area, and Bordeaux, of course, was the center of his activity. And he started to develop a reputation for being very efficient. And it sounds like he also had a reputation for being someone with relatively modern ideas, modern in terms of how to run a city. And so before he even came in contact with Louis Napoleon III, he did these things in Bordeaux that got him an international or at least a fully national reputation. He cut through old neighborhoods. If everybody wants to know why there's hardly anything medieval in Bordeaux, one of the reasons is thanks to Hausmann. He added lighting, gas lighting it was at the time, to make the streets safe, which was a really new concept. He destroyed and rebuilt an entire water distribution system to make the water healthy and safe to drink. And he even, in Bordeaux and the Gironde area, created a social welfare system for unwed mothers. Wow. Yes. A lot of these renovations had to be just physical, you know, just they needed to get sewers and water and basic stuff like that. Now, this is a long time ago, but, you know, there are still countries in the world that don't have such networks very well developed. And it's a huge problem. You have to start there, really. Yes, you'd have to start there. And it is, I think, hard for us in general to realize how much France was still really medieval at the middle of the 19th century. There were parts of France that were starting to modernize. The train helped a great deal, but it was really a kind of little by little, step by step process. And so what happened was that in 1853, his work in Bordeaux and the Gironde brought him to the attention of Napoleon III. And Napoleon III had spent several years in exile in England. And he was, among other things, he was a fascinating man, actually. He was a very interesting person. He really believed in modernizing the country, and he came back from England with some very ambitious ideas and plans. And one of the first things he wanted to do 
was change medieval Paris because Paris in the middle of the 19th century was a place that was smelly. It was dirty. The water was not drinkable. There were outbreaks of cholera everywhere. And remember, we're talking about the old parts, which is really the central part of what is now Paris. The streets were all very small, very crooked, not to mention the fact that led to sometimes ambushes if there were problems with the government and things like that. So Napoleon announced that part of his program was to really modernize and he had several goals and he listed them officially. He wanted to clean up, to beautify, to enlarge, and to modernize. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And that's exactly what happened. So he met Hausman, apparently liked him immediately. You know what, Annie? I don't even know if they were the same age or not. I think maybe they were. I think Hausman was a little younger, but I'm not certain. Probably not that. I mean, they sounded like they were similar and, you know, let's say the same generation. And so he immediately made Hausman the préfet of Paris. Which is huge. Which, which is huge. Yeah. And in 53, he was what? He was 40 in his early 40s. Okay. And he wound up, that is Hausman, he wound up being the préfet of Paris for 17 years, which is a record. Right. Perfect don't stay that long usually. No, they hardly ever stay more than just a few years. So he was given this task by Napoleon III, and he was basically given carte blanche. He was really told, this is what I want you to do. I don't know if Napoleon had any specific visual ideas of what he wanted, other than the fact that he really wanted to make the city more sanitized and to really make it more modern. And Hausman went ahead and over the next number of years, what he did was he began very simply by raising to the ground most of the very oldest part of Paris, that is around parts of Ile de la Cité, which is where Notre Dame is, parts of the other side, not the Latin Quarter side, but the other side on the Seine River. And he worked his way out and he hired, obviously, the best engineers that he could. And he created a plan, a visual plan. And in the process of that, he developed a style that he uh, insisted on having used for the buildings. To be very honest, I don't know if this is something that just came out of his imagination or whether he really worked with some architects, but everybody who's walked across some of these magnificent wide straight boulevards has seen, whether they know it or not, a building that is a Hausmannian building. Right. And, you know, today it would be city planners that would do this. Like, it's a whole, you can get a degree in city planning. But he didn't have that. He wasn't even an architect, like you said. He was a lawyer. But he had lots of ideas and he had the personality to be extremely pushy. <laughs> Get it done. To get it done. Now, there were two or three ideas that did indeed come from Napoleon, which, of course, he used. And one of Napoleon's was that he wanted to have a small park in every arrondissement. Now, he managed to put in a, at least a couple of mini parks or squares in each of the neighborhoods. But there were two big parks in Paris. One of these is the Parc Montsouris, which is in the south, in the end of the 14th arrondissement. And the other is the Parc de Butte Chaumont, which is on the northern side in the 20th, that were both created from scratch by Hausmann. Yep. Put one here. There you go. There you I go. I want it right here. There you go. <laughs> now, the Parc de Montsouris, which is in the 8th, what he did was, originally it was a private park that belonged to one of the royals. Forgive me, but I don't remember which one it was. And he simply confiscated it and made it into a public park. And there you go, too, you know. So what happened was, in the process, he managed to add green spaces. He took the Bois de Vincennes and the Bois de Bologna, and he turned them into really nice parks. They were just simply countryside with lots of forest and, at that time, but he added all of the things that make them very civilized. And in fact, what he d did with the Bois de Bologna, that became the inspiration for Central Park in New York. Yeah, so, I mean, if you put paths and roads and things like that, then it's going to be easier to access than just leaving it be wild. Exactly. Now, guess which 
street or boulevard was the very first that he finished. Rue de Rivoli. Oh, she knows this already. Yes, I do. I know a few things. Yeah. So this is in 1855. So two years later, the Rue de Rivoli was completed. And it was the prototype for absolutely every other avenue and boulevard. And believe me, they all look like avenues or boulevards. I don't know why some of them are called avenues and some of them are called boulevards, to be very honest, because they're all the same exact width. They were all specifically designed to be exactly the same in that sense. The only difference between Rue de Rivoli and others is that it's the only one with arcades. And by arcades, you mean that there are places where you can walk underneath. I mean, like there's a space, a covered space. The covered space Between the streets and the stores. Right, exactly. And actually, if you, uh, the Rue de Rivoli begins really at the end of the Marais. It begins at, uh, basically at City Hall. And it goes as far as Place de la Concorde. It's a totally straight east-west street. But it's the part that's starting at the Palais Royal and that goes to Place de la Concorde that actually has these covered arcades for the shops because it was considered to be the most exclusive part. And it is, of course, the part that's right across the street from the Louvre. Right. So Palais Royal is really interesting that way because it's you do still have all these arcades and shops. And some of them are very old and some of them have been replaced by newer shops. And some of them look like they're not, they're in between right now. You know, there's nothing there for now. But obviously, this is great real estate. It'll be back. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, You know, give me uh, 10 square meters as owner and I think I'd be happy for the rest of my life, you know, if I could rent it out, you know, that part. Yeah. Yeah. So what else? Well, he cleared out the area where, where the Il de la Cité meets Châtelet, which of course is the largest underground metro stop with how many lines, I don't know. But up above, it was known as being one of the most grungy medieval parts of really ancient Paris. And he totally cleared it out. He made big open space and had the two theaters built. Uh, that is the theater of the city and the, uh, the Théâtre du Châtelet. He opened up the huge esplanade in front of the city hall, which is a really gorgeous Renaissance building. I have the cat who's on my shoulder who's agreeing with me about all of this information, whispering in my ear. She's sniffing (laughs) sniffing at me while I talk about all of this. Maybe she's hoping to smell old Paris or something. I don't know. I'll put a photo of Elise with the cat on her. This cat, she loves you, Elise. She loves me. I know. She just loves me. Here we go. All together, Houseman destroyed over 60% of Paris, of the Paris that existed before the annexation of the outer cities. So if you can imagine that Paris was half the size of what it is today, and he destroyed, just raised to the ground, 60% of, that is a huge amount. It is estimated that he destroyed 80,000 buildings. Right. So this is the sort of thing that they could only do because this was a dictatorship, okay? I mean, you can't, I mean, okay, we're French people. We don't like to talk of ourselves in terms of we were a dictatorship, but, you know, like that's what you have to have or you can't pull off this sort of thing. And so nowadays it would not fly. It would not fly. No. So in the process, they annexed 12 villages. So the city of Paris went from being 12 arrondissements to being the 20 arrondissements that we have today. And it's very interesting to know that there were two reasons. There were two reasons, one political and one financial, for annexing all of these villages all the way around. And the political reason was because he wanted to have a bigger power base. And he also wanted to make sure that by expanding out with all of these very straight, wide streets and boulevards, that invasions would not be so easy to do, or ambushes would not be so easy to do. Of course, 1870 proved that was not necessarily true. And the other reason, which was much more important at the time, was that by annexing all of these villages, they started to pay city tax as being part of Paris. They didn't have a choice. They were just annexed. And they needed that money to finance all of this work because these were Hausmann's tasks. He had to create or he did create, whether it was really in conjunction with ideas that Napoleon III had or not. It's really hard to know. But Haussmann's streets are all 
extremely wide and perfectly straight. And they have a perspective. They have a sense of space and they connect to one another, usually with spokes. So for instance, you have, of course, the where you have the Arc de Triomphe, which has 12 spokes going out. You have the Place de la République on the eastern side. I don't know, I don't think it has 12, but it has at least six or eight spokes going out from it. Right, and that one is rectangular. It's not a circle. It's not a circle. Yeah. Right. But what he wanted was to create this sense of space, and the idea was that having things open allowed for air to circulate, which it certainly does, allowed for more sunlight to come in, and made a sense of modernity. And there was this whole notion of modernity. The other thing about Hausmann is that he developed what he called, and this was officially what he called it, the rational aesthetic. It was a rational aesthetic. In other words, it was basically a, a form of very advanced city planning for the middle of the 19th century. The idea being that you create a homogenous style of architecture and that you insist, and he insisted, this was, because in fact, he had to get private investments. This was not just uh, city or government money. They had to get enormous amounts of uh, private banks and investors to work with them to do all of this. But this is, he said, you're not going to do a facing with fake stone. This is going to be buildings made out of real stone, limestone, which is, of course, what you have in Paris. And the rooftops are going to be slate, and it's going to be four floors high with the fifth floor that is basically what today we call the servants' rooms or the students' rooms, which are basically under this kind of, you know, curved or arched rooftop. And the inside is going to be modern. We're talking about what it was like 175 years ago, what modern was 175 years ago compared to what it had been for four or 500 years, which, you know, you can imagine the difference. So there's light, there's more windows, there's a nice staircase, there's some sanitation, but obviously not this kind of sanitation we would have today. And he insisted, absolutely insisted, that all of the buildings he built look the same. Right. He wanted something uniform that looks like, you know, so they are similar, but not the same. So you can see small differences if you really pay attention. Like you can have balconies, but not on every level. The balconies can only be a certain width. There's a certain space between the floors. You know, he just set a standard and it works. And it worked. Now, what's interesting is that he had originally the idea that in creating these kinds of buildings, which were specifically designed, by the way, to be apartment buildings so that people could buy an apartment, thinking uh, the original idea was that people would buy an apartment and live in it. What did happen, though, and this has to do with what later developed into a kind of scandal around him and his work, was that many people who had money wound up speculating by buying these apartments and then renting them out. Now, originally, Hausman's project, and written down on paper, was that a lot of these buildings, at least half of the apartments would be for people with what we would today call modest incomes. Well, when you look at these apartments and you look at these buildings, it's hard to imagine that this is really what he thought of. And the top floor which really still to this day is used for a lot of times by students, university students. They've turned a lot of these tiny little rooms up on top into what are called student studios. I've actually visited a couple here in Toulouse because we have a few beautiful house many in streets actually here in Toulouse as well. And you would not believe how small they are, but this was the idea was that this was supposed to be for a single person who was relatively poor but in fact, what happened was because of all of the financial speculation, it was rich families that wound up moving into all of these houses at first. And it was the servants that wound up sleeping upstairs in these rooms that were theoretically originally designed for lower income people. So little by little, what happened was that there started to be some grumbling. Now we're talking about a project that was massive and that took a total of almost 20 years to finish. Some of these numbers are unbelievable. By modern standards, in terms of cost, the destroying and rebuilding and the building of these roads would cost anywhere between 25 and 30 billion euros. Today. Today, today, today yes. Today. Okay. 
not dollars even, but euros, yeah. It was huge cost. And what happened was they borrowed an enormous amount of money from private banks. And that meant that they had to start selling more and more of this real estate to rich people to recuperate the money, which was not completely recuperated anyway, whatever, you know. There were over 80,000 workers who worked on all of this between the road building and the houses. Over and sometimes these were the same people who had just been evicted. Yes. Would get hired to work. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing that, you know, it's one thing to say, and this was, of course, true for a certain amount of time in London, that you have to get rid of a part of the city because it's disgustingly filthy, because there's no sanitation, because of this and that. But of course, you're evicting thousands and thousands of very poor people who in the end had no housing. They had to go farther away. Right. So they just pushed them out of the city. And, and, you know, I'm sure people were not happy about it, but they weren't in the position to organize or to protest this in any way. It was going to happen. It was going to happen. No? Exactly. Yeah. So it, apparently he built over, listen to this, he built over 40,000 houses. 40,000. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Huge. Absolutely yeah. huge. Okay. So there were several people, several very well-known intellectuals, writers, politicians, who indeed were scandalized. Now, partly they were scandalized because they missed what could be romantically called the old medieval Paris, but also because of the fact that it was kicking out all of these very poor people who basically were left with not knowing where to go. One of them was someone we've talked about in relation to some other things, and that was a politician named Jules Ferry who was the, one of the people responsible for creating the bill that made education free for children in France. But another was the writer, Emile Zola, who criticized the idea of eliminating what he called the old, beautiful Paris. Now, Jules Ferry said, and I'm quoting, we weep with our eyes full of tears for the old Paris. I'm not sure. I love, as you do, I know, parts of the old Paris, but I'm not sure I would weep with tears to get rid of things that stank and were so unsanitary. It's kind of hard. It's a hard call on this one. Yeah, people in general don't like change. And French people are probably more into not liking change. But yeah, it, I guess now that it's done, we're happy it's done. But it must have been extremely painful. An entire generation of people who suffered because of all this. Exactly. And Baudelaire, of all people, he wrote a poem called The Swan, and The Swan is Paris. It's a poem in which... Is it Le Signe in French? Yeah. I'm going to have to read it. I don't remember it. Quote a, a little bit of one of the lines where he says it's a lament for the old medieval city he loved. I don't know. Interesting. I'm going to have to see if I can find it and read it. But here is a list of some of the things he did. Hausmann had... The Gare de Lyon and the Gare de l'Est built. Now, if you haven't seen the Gare de l'Est, the Gare de Lyon is big, just like the Gare du Nord, but the Gare de l'Est is superb. It's absolutely magnificent as a building. He had the theaters built on the Place du Châtelet. He opened up the Esplanade in front of City Hall, and he created the Esplanade in front of Notre Dame, which up until that time had old, funky, very run-down medieval houses right up to the doors that enter into the church. He built a whole bunch of bridges. He had the Pont Saint-Michel rebuilt completely. And interestingly enough, and this is, I guess, a sign of his ego as well, the wonderful fountain where the Boulevard Saint-Michel begins right as you get off the bridge of Saint-Michel, it was very old and funky and he decided that he wanted to do it. If you notice, it's the Archangel Michael. He decided that's what he wanted. And it was his idea to put that statue there, which came from somewhere else, and to create that fountain. And he considered that to be his spot. That was Hausman's spot. Oh, really? I didn't know this. Isn't that funny? And like, of all the places. Now, of course, Boulevard Saint-Germain, which goes east-west at the beginning, was very medieval. It, a little teeny little bit of it is, but then, of course, if you continue going west, you get to the part that's totally house many. And the Trocadero was opened up. He redid the Champs Elysees. Okay, but the Trocadero had very different buildings there. Uh, yeah. But well, now eventually, it had, right. but they've much, you know, quite a bit after 
Haussmann. They built the Palais de Chaillot and all right. that. But it right. was another 50 years or something. It was another 50 yeah. years. And of course, the Eiffel Tower talking about resisting change, you know, I mean, his project, which really affected thousands and thousands of people, of course, was really something that was talked about an enormous amount. But you're right, the, the whole resistance to change. I mean, look at the scandal that happened with how ugly the Eiffel Tower was and all of that. I mean, it is hard to create something that is very different structurally and visually than what was there before, in spite of, you know, the idea that it is sanitizing the city and making it more livable. I mean, that certainly is part of it. By the way, you know, a lot of people, including me, things I had read before, think about these open, big, straight avenues as having had a military function. Now, according to him, he was actually asked about this. He was criticized by some people saying, you know, this is a way for the government to be able to control better, the, the, to control the population because you can get the armies down the streets. His response to that was, never dawned on me, but why not? Basically, that was his response. It was not the specific reason. He really had this idea of this very rational kinds of architecture that was very open and spacious, but he was not against the idea that, that might be something that could be used in any event. You know, I mean, that yeah, it's kind of a happy secondary exactly. consequence or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, all of this took 17, almost 18 years. And by the time we get up to basically 1869, going into 1870, there is a lot of conflict. There's a lot of criticism, largely because of how much this is costing. The city has gone into debt, really huge debt to do all of this work. There are people, of course, who are more involved in the social aspect who are worried about what's going to happen to all these poor people who no longer have a place to live. Do you know if they got, like, compensated or not? I do not know. I do not know. But from what I read, it doesn't sound like it. I'm going to have to look into this because it's possible they were compensated, but beneath what they should have been. To be honest, I don't know. For instance, if you imagine what I was reading yesterday, they said that in the oldest part around the Ile de la Cité and right around the Châtelet, there were sometimes 15 people living in one room. I mean, that's how it was so densely populated that there was no way of stopping disease from spreading. And they had so many outbreaks of cholera and so many, they must have had tuberculosis, must have had so much of it and all of the diseases that spread that way. Now, my guess is that not Many of those people were owners of where they were living. That you know, probably who were the owners? I have no idea. When you go to Tuile de la Cité now, he did save, of course, Saint Chapelle, and he did save the Conciergerie specifically because of the importance that they had for historical purposes. When you go to the back, you have a more modern, not modern, twentieth century, but nineteenth century architecture behind them. The part that's across from there, where you have the flower garden, it's also been it was changed under Hausmann. What's really interesting is that he understood about appearances in the sense that he specifically made that huge esplanade in front of Notre Dame. If you go down the side of Notre Dame, not the side that's on the riverside, but the other side, there are two or three medieval streets that still exist. One of them, I think, is called the Street of the Rue de la, de, de, du Croître, because that's where uh, there was a, a cloister belonging to a convent there. It's interesting that they kept the streets but they modernized the buildings that were on them. It's kind of interesting to see where he said stop and where he didn't, you know, who knows, you know, really. But what happened was by the end of his reign as préfet, people couldn't stand him anymore. They decided that he was, he was making the government go bankrupt and that the costs were so exorbitant and he basically couldn't stop. It was almost like he just couldn't stop. He couldn't stop spending money. He couldn't stop with his projects. So finally, what happened was the parliament under Napoleon III, who had been president and then declared himself emperor at the very last of his reign, he decided that he wanted to make the country a little bit more of a republic. And so what happened was that he loosened up certain rules. And in the parliament, there were more and more people who were pretty much on, let's say, moderate left side. And they were the ones who hated Hausmann for what he had basically done to the city. And so they put enough pressure on Napoleon III so that he told Hausmann that he wanted him to resign. That's crazy, because he's the one who enabled it, the whole thing. 
Yeah. But then it's Haussmann that has to resign. <laughs> but he didn't. So this is what happened. He, Haussmann, in his own, and his, you know, he refused. And so Napoleon III fired him. He fired him. And Haussmann said, because he spent, he was already, well, let's see, he was already, I think, in his 60s. He went on to be a senator. He actually went on to be in politics. He became a deputy from Corsica. Why Corsica? I have absolutely no idea. It was because he was a Bonapartist, maybe. So he wound up becoming a member of parliament. And in his last years, before he died in 1891, he wrote his memoir. And he wrote, it took him a number of years. He wrote down all of the things that he did and everything. And he said in his memoir, he said, I committed two wrongs. I was prefet for too long, and people get tired of saying the same face all the time. No, it wasn't about his face, no. And I disturb people's habits by turning Paris upside down. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and of course, what he left out was that by pretty much bankrupting the, the, the government, because he really was a spender. He was not, you know, he didn't really worry about how much he was spending. So he died in 1891, and he is buried in Père Lachaise. So you can go by and you can say hello. I don't know if the word baron is on his tombstone. I should have looked it up to see. It's kind of interesting because it really was true that he called himself Baron Hausman. And people asked him at the end of his life how he could give himself the title because he gave it to himself. And he said, well, my great-grandfather was whatever, it was a baron or something, you know, lower aristocracy. And he said, since there were no other male descendants and I'm the closest to him, I decided that it was entitled to the title. <laughs> he might have made that up too. Who knows? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, well, let's say this. I guess sometimes in history, to get something major done like this, you have to have an ego that goes with it, you know? His work was so influential that other cities in France, of course, rebuilt parts of their architecture in the same style. And that includes a good, good part of Bordeaux, a little part of Toulouse, a big part of Marseille, and... Lyon, not so much, right? Lyon, not so much. But again, there must be, there are, I'm sure, other cities that I don't know that well that have a section that's very house Minion as well. But believe it or not, there were some other major capitals in Europe and even elsewhere that were so inspired by his style of architecture that they added or changed a huge section of their cities. And those include, believe it or not, Brussels, Vienna, Madrid, Stockholm, and Buenos Aires, and Cairo, and Istanbul. Wow, interesting. all have parts of their city that are actually house Menian, right? It's really interesting because if Paris hadn't gone through this terrible time, it wouldn't be what we know today. And I don't think anybody would be paying any attention to Paris today. Like if it had remained a medieval city, it wouldn't be the attraction that it is. It just cannot be because it's, I mean, you see the cities in France that didn't go through a lot of these, like Rodez. It has a lot of charm, it's, but it's mostly remained medieval. You know, it, and it has its charm, but you don't see buses of people visiting Rodez, right? It's just not like... Well, I think because those cities or imagining even Paris having stayed medieval, what would have happened is that by the beginning of the 20th century, a good chunk of that would have been destroyed and built in any which way, basically. And it would have been relatively ugly modern style architecture and it wouldn't have had I think one of the graces of what he did is the homogenous quality to it there's a grace honestly I mean I love the medieval Paris I really do but there is a kind of gracefulness and elegance to these boulevards with these beautiful buildings with the beautiful slate roofs and it gives a sense of real class to the city of Paris yeah and, you know, as a whole, France is a country that has valued infrastructure. Now, this probably started with Haussmann, but it continues to this day. We still, you know, we're one of the countries that has very nice freeways, well-maintained freeways. They're not cheap, but they're very well-maintained. We have very nice trains. 
so many lines that many of them fell into disuse because, you know, the, we have rail lines going to a lot of tiny places where it doesn't make sense to have a train. But now they're talking about possibly uh, rehabilitating these lines and using them for much smaller trains, you know, like uh, some sort of small electric service that's almost automatic. Like it just goes back and forth between this small town and this small town. So infrastructure has always been really important in France. And I think it really started with Haussmann. Whether or not all of these cities look Haussmannian, you know, his spirit lives on in a way. Yes, I agree. And I think that it is true that if he hadn't done all of that, Paris would not be pretty today because even if it kept some of the old medieval parts, I think there's a vision. When people think of Paris, besides the beautiful the character. I mean, let's face it, the Latin Quarter and the Marais, they're romantic in a certain kind of way because of the character of that kind of the narrow little streets. And of course, it's very well kept up and it's very carefully taken care of, you know, these days. But there is a certain elegance to Paris. I mean, this is what makes it so beautiful to see. And there are cities, when you go to them, they have just a little bit of hodgepodge of architecture here and there. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So it really is thanks to Hausmann, maybe thanks to Napoleon III as well, you know, that we really do have such such a beautiful city. And the people of Paris who lived through this are to be admired because they put up with a lot of disruptions. Lot. They did indeed. And just, you know, another one of these little anecdotes about what people hated. He lopped off a section of the Luxembourg Garden, by the way to build the uh, Boulevard de Raspail, which is a ah, yeah. wonderful boulevard that goes all the way from Luxembourg Garden all the way to the other end of Montparnasse. And because of that, they had to move the fountain, the Medici fountain and the gardens. Well, you know, I'm sure at the time it was very upsetting, but the gardens are still gorgeous. It it's works. still big. It, it still works. You know, the palace is still there. So yeah, that's what happens when things change. So Haussmann, a complicated man who did some all in all, some beautiful work, but I'm glad he wasn't my neighbor. <laughs> oh, he wouldn't have evicted you, Annie. Sure, sure. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Merci, Elise. You're welcome, Annie. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. You can join them at patreon.com for slash join us, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. Join us, no spaces or dashes, and you'll get access to many exclusive rewards. A warm welcome this week to new patrons, happy travels, Susan Nelson and Neil Shore. Your dedication to keeping this podcast going is very, very much appreciated. If I did not have a dependable income from my patrons, I wouldn't be able to do this podcast. It's as simple as that. Would I like a raise? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Have you noticed everything is getting more expensive? As a podcaster, I need a few new people to chip in every week. Is it going to be you? I hope so. Upon becoming a patron, I recommend you download the Patreon app for easy access to your rewards on the go. You can enjoy perks like French pronunciation assistance, personal video updates as I explore France, and delicious French recipes beyond the ones you can already try from my cookbook, Join Us at the Table. Today, I'll make a video about cooking mushrooms. Mushrooms can be delicious or they can be bland and boring. I'll show you how I make mine tasty. And I have a driving in France video in the queue. I'm waiting for the rain to stop. It shouldn't be long. We haven't had that much rain. And if you're gearing up for a journey to France and listening to as many episodes as possible to prepare, keep doing it. That's a great way to prepare your trip. You can also take advantage of my expertise as your personal itinerary consultant. To get started, simply follow these steps. Number one, purchase the service at joinusinfrance.com for a slash boutique. Number two, complete a questionnaire to share your travel ideas and preferences. Number three, schedule a phone appointment during which we'll discuss your plans for about an hour. And number four, 
after our conversation, I'll send you a comprehensive document outlining the itinerary that we discussed. Now, please note that my schedule is booked up several weeks in advance. It's two months in advance right now. To find my next available date, visit the only place where you can buy this service, the Join Us in France boutique. And if my schedule is fully booked and you're unable to consult with me directly, fear not, you can still take me along your Parisian adventure with my GPS self-guided tours available on the VoiceMap app. I've created seven immersive tours, each showcasing a distinct, iconic neighborhood of Paris. Choose from the Eiffel Tower, which is available in English or French, Ile de la Cité, Le Marais, Montmartre, Saint-Germain-des-Prés, or the Latin Quarter. And you can take those tours at any time, even far from Paris. But I'll tell you what, these tours are best taken in Paris when you can see the sights and smell the croissant. Access these tours via the VoiceMap app for immediate access or receive a special listener discount by buying codes at joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique. Okay, let's talk about passports now. You have to renew your passport early, very, very early. Kim Cox, who is coming to the boot camp, wrote this. Our U.S. passport renewals just came in. We applied in January and she wrote this just a week ago. Okay, so this was early April. We applied in January. They are so very backed up and we were getting super nervous. We had to call our congressman to get them shaken loose. Annie, you might want to tell your U.S. podcast listeners that they need to apply super early and get their congressional representatives involved when they are delayed and have upcoming travel. We got ours three days after our call. Hmm, Miracle. Now I can really get excited about meeting all of you. I look forward to meeting you also, Kim. And do take a look at your passport. And if it's within a year of expiration, start the renewal process because those things take time. Now, travel question of the week. Should you book restaurants in Paris? There are nonstop questions about this on the Facebook group. What's your favorite restaurant? What are your must try? Should I lay awake at two in the morning worrying that I won't get a reservation to that one place everyone wants to go to? Okay, here's the problem. Restaurants do not want to take reservations too early because they know things happen and plans change. And honestly, they don't care who sits at the table. They just want a paying customer in the seat. They all have their method to ensure the restaurant is going to be full. Well, full enough but not too full, right? You got to get it just right. Some restaurants open reservations three months early, some three weeks early, some three days early, and some never. (laughs) There is no rhyme or reason to this. Some are listed on apps like The Fork or Zen Chef, and you can reserve quite easily that way. I love it when they do that, but not all of them do. Some of them you need to call. It just depends. Having said that, There are a lot of restaurants in Paris. I asked ChatGPT, how many restaurants are there in Paris? And it said, between 40,000 and 45,000 restaurants in Paris. Then I asked it to cite its source. And it said, I quote, As an AI language model, I am unable to provide direct citations or real-time data. End quote. Is that how you are? Not citing your source because you're making things up, are you? (laughs) ChatGPT makes a lot of things up. So I went to the Yellow Pages. The Yellow Pages list almost 16,000 restaurants in Paris. You get the gist. There are a lot of restaurants in Paris. And if you've ever been to Paris, you know this, right? The only time you should worry, lay awake at night, do whatever it is you do when you worry, is uh, for a special event, okay? Somebody's birthday, somebody's anniversary, a celebration that you want to have, no matter why. If you only eat certain things, it's good to find out where those things are going to be and perhaps book for those things. But for most of us and for most meals, and by most, I mean 90%, I say don't sweat it. You will eat well in Paris. 
There is no need to run all over the creation to try a restaurant just because someone said that it was great. I read the reviews visitors write. It's stuff like, this was the best Boeuf Bourguignon I've ever had. And of course, it was the first Boeuf Bourguignon I've ever had. But I am a food critic now. <laughs> On the Facebook group, someone wrote, I'm worried that I have made a mistake and fallen right into a tourist trap. Let me ask you, what's a tourist trap anyway? A restaurant that looks good because you're starving and you need to get off your feet? And what's wrong with that? <laughs> so long as they serve a decent steak frite, who cares? So slow down, slow down, and look for the menu that's posted before you sit down. It'll have everything you need to know. The sort of food they serve, the prices. You can see if there's room to sit down or not, right? You're right there. Perhaps use the bathroom before you order and you'll get a glimpse into the kitchen. You know, kitchens are very small and very messy in Paris. Don't be too OCD. But I mean, we all have our limits, okay? I think I've walked out of one restaurant, one restaurant my whole life. I'm getting old, but... <laughs> So it's not like, you know, it's a big worry most of the time. If you absolutely must avoid busy restaurants right in the middle of the action because you'll hate it there, all you have to do is walk a block in any direction to see if restaurants on the calmer streets seem better to you. It's not a guarantee either, but at least you'll know that they won't be as busy and may give you better service. Again, no matter where you go, look for the menu they've posted and read it. I know it's in French, but it's not Chinese characters. You can read the words, and many of them will make sense, even if you don't speak a lick of French. Still not sure? Learn about Google Lens. Look it up. It's magic. It can translate anything for you. And go with what seems better to you, of course. Trust your senses. You will not starve in Paris, no matter where you are. And no need to reserve unless it's a special occasion. Now, I write tours. I have to try restaurants in that area because people expect a recommendation from the tour guide. And I also like to try restaurants. I like food, okay? <laughs> I do it because it's part of my job. But you have the freedom to go wherever your nose and eyes tell you to go. Celebrate that and whatever you do, don't worry about it too much. You can help your friends plan their trips to France by sharing the podcast trailer with them. Where is that? Go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash trailer. Copy that link, share it wherever, Facebook, wherever you would like to. In your email, I don't know. Somebody, you know, is going to France. That person needs a little common sense before getting to France. So send them to the trailer, would you? And I would love to play more voice feedback on the show. If you have a question or comment, record a voice memo on your phone and email it to me, annie at joinusinfrance.com, and I will play it on the show. Show notes and a full transcript for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 437, the numeral. A big thank you to podcast editor Christian Kotoven, who produces the transcripts so you can find in which episode we talked about that place that you're interested in. Next week on the podcast, a trip report with Adrian Abioden and Natalie Michelle, who were looking for Josephine Baker in France and what a great time they had doing it. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2023 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.